We're now recording. Hi everyone, um, again, welcome to uh, tonight's GTUG, the August Google Technology User Group here in Sydney. Um, um, tonight, uh, Rob Pike and myself will be giving a pair of talks about the Go programming language, um, and I'd like to welcome Rob uh, first up to talk about lexical scanning in Go. Thank you. Are we good, Tim? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm here to talk about lexical scanning in Go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thanks everyone for coming. And of course, this is streaming out live and will be available, I think, on YouTube later. Yeah. Um, yes, I hear. Okay. Um, so, how many of you are familiar with the work of Michael Jackson? Really? Quite a few? Uh, a couple, maybe? All right. Well, as you know, Michael Jackson uh, developed Jackson's structural programming, which was a model uh, based uh, for solving uh, structural mismatch problems in computing. Um, and these come up a lot, and he really pointed out, I think correctly, that many programming problems deal with having data in one form and data in another form, trying to connect them up, and you find that the flow of control on both sides doesn't really work very well. So you've got blocks coming in, you want to turn to lines, and you have partial lines and partial blocks, and it's all kind of a mess. And a lot of programming is very difficult to get right when you have to deal with these things. And pretty much any sort of data processing problem has at least some aspect of that flavor in it. Examples are obvious blocking, unblocking, uh, packet assembly, and even to some extent lexing and parsing. Um, these, these two pieces are particularly difficult because usually you've got some, maybe some buffering on each side, you've got some look ahead, some state, you've got a peek ahead, look behind, and you're doing it on both sides at once and it's quite messy. Um, it's actually, I believe, true that coroutines were just invented, discovered, as a way of solving this particular problem before even Jackson had pointed out that this was a problem in itself. And so coroutines are kind of the, the origin of, of concurrent programming, and yet they were solved, they were invented for this notion of very simple sort of distributed, not, sorry, non-distributed data management problem, which is kind of interesting. When you do a coroutine model right, you get to write both pieces of the problem, the, the block reader and the line processor or whatever, completely independently, and they switch control as necessary, and the, the program can become quite a bit nicer as a result. And I'd like to look at that sort of approach and the concept of a uh, lexical scanner. Um, and the context for the lexical scanner is a template system. Now, I did a, a text template system, which you can think of as an HTML template system, but it was a little more general than that, uh, very early in the development of the Go libraries. And it, it, to be honest, it wasn't very good. We thought it was really cool at the time. Uh, we were wrong. Um, it was pretty inflexible and inexpressive. People stumbled on it. A lot of other uh, contributors came up with other approaches to templates that were probably more suited to what they wanted to do. But most important for me, the code was very fragile. And as it developed, we started to want to add things like numerical constants and quoted strings, and the whole code just sort of didn't accept it very well. It was clunky. And so a while ago, uh, earlier this year, I decided to write a new one, knowing what we know about what templates ought to look like, but this time building them as a proper lexed, parsed template thing that I could then write clean, good code. And what I want to show you today is how the lexer works in that, which is about as nerdy a thing as you can talk about. But I think you'll find that it's actually quite pretty how it turned out. So what we have is a new template system. I'm not going to teach you the template system. It's beyond the scope of this talk, although it's probably a, a good talk on its own. Um, I just want to point out what it is we're actually looking for when we're lexing the templates. So we have this arbitrary text and these things called actions, which are delimited by pairs of braces, two open braces, two closing braces. Everything between is an action that might be some text, to uh, an expression to evaluate, or a method to call, or some field of a data structure, and so on. So here's some examples. Um, the simple evaluator just consists of, the of a field of a data structure, dot title. There's sort of an implicit context in which that's evaluated. Um, there are constants and functions, so you can do things like call printf inside there, and it knows how to format that number as a hex number, and uh, yes, that truly is a complex constant in there. Uh, it might be the first introductory template slide that has a complex number on it, but hey, it's there. Uh, there are control structures, obvious things for looping and, and conditional evaluation and stuff like that. So you can see what we have is, is the basic lexemes of just about any programming language you're going to use except Perl. Um, so today I want to talk about the lexer itself, what it does, and that means we have to think about the things we want to extract from the input stream and deliver as what are called tokens. So obviously there's the stuff outside the actions, that's trivial, that's just text, but then we have the delimiters for the actions, the identifiers and the thing, other things inside the actions like numeric constants, strings, 
odds and ends, bits and pieces. And these are the individual, usually multi-character pieces that the parser will use to construct a parse tree with which you can evaluate the template. So how do you, how do you represent a lexed item, a thing you deliver to the, the parser? Now, the usual way you do this is you, you have a lexer that delivers these things called lexemes or items. I call them items, lex items. And they consist of two pieces. There's a type and there's a value. And the type is usually just a, an integer that identifies what it is. And so, for example, if you're delivering the number 23.2, the type of the item is going to be number, or some, some constant that represents the type number. And the value is going to be 23.2. And it turns out for this particular lexer, and in fact true for most lexers, what you really want is the string, not the number 23.2 as a floating point number or anything like that, but just the textual string of the lexeme. So an item is, a, is the number, and the string represents the number, or the word, or an identifier, and the value of the identifier, and so on and so on. So there's this thing called an item type in there. That's an actual defined type, and it's really trivial. It's just an integer. So we define in Go type item type int, um, which is a little bit like a type def in in C or C++, but not really because it, it's not an alias. It's a true new type, and it, it means that you can do things with that type you couldn't do with an integer. And I'll show you one in a minute. And then we define a bunch of, of uh, definitions, variables, values, constants with that type to identify the various lexeme types we're going to be emitting. And we start with a list. Uh, there's a thing called item error, which is actually going to be helpful. We'll see why in a minute. Item dot, item EOF, which is very special. And there's some more coming up on the next slide. But I want to point out this first line inside the constant block there that says item error, item type equals iota. That means declare the constant called item error, whose type is item type. And that equals iota is a, um, a nice little piece of Go code that says start counting as though I'm going to create an enumerated constant. And then after that, all of the other items in the const block uh, are going to get sequential values. So item error is going to be 0, item dot is going to be 1, item uf is going to be 2. But those are not regular 0, 1, 2. They're 0, 1, 2 of type, item type. Okay? And here's the rest of them, uh, or at least a lot of them. Uh, so you can see we've got some keyword identifiers like else and end. Uh, range is a keyword. There's the meta, left meta string and the right meta strings represented as, as types because that's how you do this. Um, and then an interesting one here is item number, which I showed you earlier as an example. So when you want to emit 23.2, that's the constant value of the item type that goes along with that number. So now we've defined these, what we know what a type is. Just for the record, let's show how you print it in Go. Even though we're not going to print it in the examples we're using, it's great for debugging and it's an interesting piece of Go code. Now, the formatted library for Go has a uh, called printf, which is very much like C printf that you're probably at least a little familiar with. But it has one nice property that's, that's unique to Go, which is that any type that has a method called string, capital string, that returns string as a basic type is known to printf and can be used by printf so you get a default pretty print for that type value. So here is the type. Uh, the item now, not the item type, the actual item, which is a type, remember, it has those two fields in it. And here's the string method that prints it out neatly for probably debugging, not much else. Um, so you switch on the actual type of the item, which is going to be like item EOF or something like that. And there's two special cases. If it's EOF, chances are you just want to say print it, pretty print as EOF. Uh, if it's got an error, I'm going to show you errors later, the trick is we're going to store the value of the item as the actual error string. Even though it's not inside the input, we're going to make up a value and store it there. And otherwise, we just print it out kind of neatly. But there's a little trick here, because if you've got maybe um, a text block, it might be like 10,000 characters long. You don't want to have the, the printed out as a 10,000 character blob. So we check if the value is really long, we truncate it and put a dot, dot, dot on. So that, it, that little piece of code there, it's not particularly interesting. But once you've written this, you can just printf any item, and it'll print neatly on the, on the output. OK, those are items. Now what? How do we tokenize? How do we take our input stream and break it into the things of, of item? Uh, there's lots of ways to do it that are, are well known. Uh, we could use a tool. Lex is a very famous one, uh, originally written by Mike Lesk and then re redone when he was an intern by someone called Eric Schmidt. Um, we could use regular expressions to do it. Uh, we can also write the code ourselves using states, actions, and a switch statement. I'll show you that in a second. We're not going to do any of these, but let me talk about why I'm not using any of these. First of all, tools. There's nothing wrong with using a tool to do this. Don't, don't take away from this that I think these tools are a bad idea. 
Some of them are pretty cool. But I do think they have problems that are often neglected. One thing is when you're parsing input, it's very important to get good error messages. And tools make it actually harder than it should be to get good error messages out. And when you're lexing, it tends to, to be a particular problem. You also, if you're using a tool, you have to learn the tool, and you have to often learn a language with which to program the tool. And so I think we already have a language in hand. Why do we need to learn another one? It's, it's sort of a step back. Um, a real problem, though, is that the things can be large and even slow. Um, Lex is famous for generating enormous data structures to run even simple Lex machines. And so I, I think it's actually not a very good program for doing this anymore, although things like Raggle are, are quite a bit better. And it can often be a fairly poor fit. The, the, tools that the, lang the, the, the tools that the tool gives you to do the Lexing can sometimes not fit very well what it is you're actually trying to do. Um, and so Lexing is easy to do yourself. Maybe we just should. But how do we do that? Well, we have regular expressions or a standard thing. And I don't want to talk too much about this. I actually wrote a blog post about a week ago on this topic. Just coincidentally, I happened to be um, uh, talking about uh, a code review with somebody who was trying to do some lexing, and he was using regular expressions. And I tried to explain to him why I thought that was a bad idea. The key point is that it's kind of too big a tool for such a small job. Um, regular expressions engines are big and they're complicated, and they tend to have to evaluate a large state space. And often the questions they're asking are much harder than the question you need to ask. You don't need to see if there's any of these 55 keywords when all you really need to know is what the next character is and things like that. Also, it's a, they're very fancy. Regular expressions are beautiful things. I've implemented them. I love playing with them. But they're a very dynamic, sort of interesting, expressive way of, of doing things. Um, but when you're lexing, everything's very static. It's very simple. You know what the grammar is. You know what the lexemes are. And the dynamic in machinery is probably overkill for this. But it's not, a, it's not a bad way to do it. I just don't like to do it. So we should write our own, because it's easy, right? Anybody can write code, uh, especially programmers. And so um, there's also a trick here to notice, which is once you've written a lexer for a modern language, by modern I mean any kind of programming language that you'd see today, chances are it's almost the same lexer as you'd use for any other language. So once you know how to do it once, you can do it for anything you want to write. And some of us tend to play with languages for a living, so it's nice to know how to do that. Um, being able to adapt them easily is great, but of course, that's also an argument both for and against tools, because if the tool can do it once, then you can, it can do it a second time just as easily. Well, I'll take it as an argument against tools, though. So here's how most people would write uh, a lexer if they were designed to do it this way. They'd define some states, like inside a comment, inside text, inside an action, and then they'd define actions themselves, like uh, you know, absorb the next, absorb up to the end of the number, or whatever. And then you switch. You come in with a state, you decide what state you're in, you execute some action. The result of that action is probably to emit some tokens, but also give you back the new state. So when you hit the beginning of a comment, the action consumes the text, starts the comment, and the new state is inside comment. Um, and so you, you go around here. And it looks really simple, right? Anybody could write this. But it's kind of boring. It's kind of repetitive code. It usually looks a little less boring than this, but it's still pretty boring. But I'd like to point out that when you're in here, let's say you're on action two, you return a state. And then you go back to the caller with your lexeme. And you come back in again, and you, you knew what state you were in, but now the system has to work it out again. The state variable has lost at the place where you were. When you came back from action two, you knew that you were, say, in state one. So why do you need to leave and come back and then figure out where you were again and get back to where you were? Why not just go right to state one? There's something wrong with this model. Right? Uh, it's not bad, but you can do better. So I want to do better. I want to not throw away the state uh, when we know what it is. I want to just continue to move to the next state. So we're always in the state machine crunching along. And so we have to figure out what a state is and what an action is. So a state represents where we are in the input and what we're expecting to see next, which may be a number of different things that affect what we do. And the action represents what we're going to do in that state given a certain piece of input. Once you execute the action, you get a new state and you go around again. That's pretty much the code. So let's define a state function. We, put, we combine the concept of a state and an action into a function. And that function has type, which I call state function. The bottom line of this slide is a definition in Go of a state function. And it's a little bit of a, a mind blower, because a state function is a function that returns a state function. And I give it the argument of a lecture here, because we're going to need that. But don't worry about that lecture detail. It, it, it could be a method of lecture, but then they'd be state methods, and that doesn't sound right. So we'll just call them state functions. So I want to point out, this is a recursive type definition. A state function is a function that returns a state function. Okay. Now, what do you do with that? Well, you run the state function, like this. 
Here's the, here's the inner loop of our lexer. No switch anymore. Instead, what we do is we just hang around, looping. We set state to the start state, whatever that is. We'll come back to that. And then as long as the state is not nil, we run the lexer. And we run it one state at a time by saying state equals state of lexer. What that means is call the lexer, sorry, call the state function with the lexer as an argument. The return value of state function is a state function. So that's the new state function. You store it inside the variable state and go around the loop again. So the switch statement we had back here has now been folded into a single line of code that just runs itself constantly. Get a state, call it, get a state, call it, get a state, call it. And we don't have to work out every time what state we're in and do a switch statement to get back to where we just were. We're always in the right place. The PC is always pointing at where we want to be next. Does everybody see that? It's, it's at some level trivial. At some level, it's kind of amazing. But it's kind of cute. OK, so now let's get real. The problem with this is, of course, nowhere in here do you see anyone emitting any tokens. All we have is a state machine. Somebody's got to get the tokens coming out of Alexa, and, we have, and we've covered that up. So we do that by adding the concurrent step, which is where Go actually comes in pretty nicely here. The idea is we're going to run the lexer as a coroutine in concurrently with the client, which is probably something like a parser. And they're just two independent machines doing their own thing. Lexing, generating lexemes, parsing, generating parse trees. And then whenever the lexer has a new thing, it actually lobs it over the wall to the parser using a Go channel. And if you don't know what that is, just think of it as being like a pipe in Unix terms, except it's got some you know, stricter semantics. But essentially, it's just a way to deliver data over, over a, to another part of the program that may be uh, running completely independently. And so we actually break the program into the lexer running as one program over here, the parser is another one, and they communicate using this channel of items. So let's define the lexer. Now we know roughly what we're doing. And here's the, here's the definition of the lexer type. It's got a bunch of fields in it that are not relevant yet, but they will be later. The bottom one here is the one that matters right now. It says items, and that's a chan of item. So that declares in Go terminology a channel of items. That is the pipe, if you will, on which the lexer is going to deliver items to the parser. OK? So now we've got to create one of these things and get it running. So let's write a, a little function that creates a lexer. We give uh, the function uh, returns a lexer, a pointer to a lexer, actually, but a lexer, and a channel of items. It's kind of a weird API. There's a reason for it. Uh, this is all real code, by the way. Uh, so there's some glitches in here which are going to get fixed later. This is a very early version of the code. Um, and we have this function lex that takes a name and an input string, creates this lexer data structure by filling in the relevant fields. Notice in Go, you don't only have to fill in the ones you care about. The rest will be initialized to 0. And then this line here is where the magic starts. Go l.run. That starts up. Remember we had this run loop, l.run, like that? We're going to run it, concurrently run the state machine in parallel with us, and then return. So the state machine is now off, ready, waiting for input, of generating lexemes. And now we return back to the caller, probably the parser that started us. And he's going to parse, and he's going to receive the lexemes from the channel that the runner is delivering on. So here's what the real run routine looks like. It's now a method of lexer that's still called run. The only differences between this and the little sort of schematic version I showed you before, this is honest code. There's no cheats here. Uh, we now know what, what the original initial state is. It's going to be plain text. We probably start at the beginning of the file expecting some plain text for a while. So we'll start in the text state. I'll show you that in a second. Then we run the state equals state of L loop just like we did before. And then a little piece of Go magic. Don't worry about it. Close of L.items when we're done means uh, tell, it's a way to tell the parser that it's not going to get any more tokens. That's kind of a nuance, but I want to be honest about what the code really looks like. But it's still the same loop as before, and now we know where to start. We have to write a state function called lex text. That's what you do when your state is, I'm just processing regular text, and I haven't hit an action yet. So in order to do that, we're going to have to find a way to emit tokens back to the caller. So here's a couple more fields from that lexer. They were on the previous slide, but I've isolated them here. The input string, we remembered that when we created the lexer. And we've got two integer variables, start and pause, which aren't particularly good names, but that's what they are. Um, and the idea is you've got this string that you're, you're scanning. You're, you're running, I guess, from your point, you're running this way, right? And so start is where the, this token, we're, the next token we're going to send out actually begins. And pause is where we are in our scanning. So when we have a token, that is the substring between start and pause of the input. Okay? And so that's all we need to know to do an emit. So here's a met emit method on 
lexer, it takes an argument, which is the type, and it sends on the channel, that little left arrow, less than minus thing, is a send operation. It sends on the items channel an item constructed from the type and the input string sliced from the start to the position. So that lobs the, the item over the wall to the parser. And then to move ahead in the input, all we do is move start up to pause. So you go scan, 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 aha, here's an item, throw it over the fence, thump, and then do the next one, throw it. That's the model, OK? It's all pretty clean. OK, now we have almost everything we need to get it going. I just need to focus now on, this is exactly the same code as before. I haven't changed it. I just wanted to put it up again, because there's that lex text word. That's the start state, which is a really important thing about a scanner. What state do you start in? And what, what lex text is going to do is scan the input until he finds an action, which is that left curly brace started thing, right? So we have a constant called left meta, which is what lex text is going to look for. And when, as soon as it finds one of those, it throws out all the text it's found so far as a plain text item and starts working on actions. So I think we're ready. Yes. So this is Lex text. There's a lot of code here. Um, well, actually, there's not that much. But it's really pretty simple. At the top, there's a for loop. Remember, this is a state function. Notice it's a, it returns a state function. What we do is we loop on the input, advancing start until, and you'll see, I'll show you how start gets moved. Um, and as long as you're not sitting on a uh, uh, opening action, left brace pair. So forever, if the place you are in the, in the input, which is pause, has a left meta, that means you're sitting on the left brace starting an action. And so everything from there back to start is plain text. So if that's, if it, if that's a non-empty string, if pause is greater than start, emit a text token. I showed you emit. And now the new state is le lex left meta, because now we're sitting we're right before left meta. Now we've got a lexeme that we have to find called left meta, and we know how to do that. We do that by returning a state function that knows how to scan a left meta pair. right? So here's a state function, and it returns a state function. And then there's some stuff around how to deal with EOF. It's actually pretty clean, but I think it's more of a distraction than anything. So just think of that for loop. Uh, you scan till you find a left meta. Uh, when you do, you emit any text that you found, and then the new state is lex a left meta. So let's lex a left meta. It's a trivial one, and it may be actually an easier one to, to, to see what's going on. Here's a left meta function, uh, state function. So first of all, uh, you know because of how you got here that the input is sitting on that left meta. And so all you have to do is advance the position by the length of a left meta. You know it's there because you've already checked that. So you just say pause plus equals. Now you've, got, you've done that. You're now sitting on the pair of braces. Emit a left meta item, which will pull out the braces and say it's a left meta. And now we've entered inside one of these bracketed action blocks. And so now our new state is lex inside an action. OK, everybody following along what's going on here? It's pretty trivial. It looks, it looks like there's a lot going on, but it's actually very simple. OK, I'm going to go two more functions into this to show you the model, because we, we want to get to a state where we can really do some fun. So this is what inside an action looks like. And this is fairly representative of what you see when you write lexers. What we do is we're looking for what's next. Okay? And inside action, when we're inside action, we, we're inside an action, we don't know what we're on. Is, is a number coming up? Is an identifier coming up? A string constant? We don't know. So we've got to ask, what are we sitting on right now? So it's basically a bunch of questions. Uh, does the input at this point have a right meta? If that's true, we're no longer inside the action, and so we return to lex the right meta, and I bet you guys could write that one now, right? Otherwise, we better look at what the next rune is. That's l.next, the next input character. And we ask some questions about it. Is it EOF or new line? That's an error, because that means there's a, we don't want uh, actions spanning a new line, so there's an un, it's like an unbounded parenthesis here. So we return l.error of that, and I'll show you how errors are handled later. It fits in beautifully. Uh, if it's a space, we don't care. It just means there's a space in between the words, and we just ignore it. I'll show you ignore in a minute. And then we get some interesting ones. If it's a pipe, that's a pipe character, which is important to the template system. It doesn't matter what it does. Um, then there's some more of the details. Uh, if it's a double quote, well, we go into lex quote state. If it's a back quote, we go into the lex raw quote state, which is a different kind of string in Go, which is useful to have in the template system. And then a couple of interesting cases. If it's a plus, a minus, or a digit, then We've stepped into a number. We've gone one character into a number. So what we want to do is actually back up. I'll show you how to do that. 
uh, and then say, now we're going to like a number. And I'm going to show you like number because it's kind of cool. Okay? And otherwise, if that didn't work, but you're now on an alphanumeric, you know it's not a digit, so it must be an alpha. And so now you back up again, and now you're doing an identifier. Okay? And there's about four more cases, but I think this gives you the flavor of how this works. And compared to what a regular expression does to work this out, it's actually, in some senses, simpler. Of course, there's more code. But it's really nice how you just sort of pick up one character. What do I do now? I'm, I move on. It's kind of nice. OK, now I'm going to show you a few helper functions that are important to make this all work. And then I'm going to show you how to like some number, which is kind of amazing. So um, next is the thing that gives you the next input character, which we call a rune in Go, because it's a full UTF-8 decoded character. OK? And so we ask um, if the position, if we've reached the end of the string, we've got EOF. There's no more characters to come. EOF is sort of a magic uh, out-of-band rune signal. Otherwise, we parse the next uh, UTF-8 encoded character from the input and set, advance the position by that, because this is next. We're absorbing the, that string out of the, sorry, that character out of the string. So we advance next, pass, start, and we return the rune that we actually got, which is probably going to be something like a, an A or a 9 or parenthesis or whatever. So that gets you the next character and moves, steps you through the input. So you understand if you step back, what's happening is we're just calling next to step through until we find the transition out of this lexeme, and that lexeme goes out to the parser. OK, now we've got some helper functions that are really nice to have. Here's ignore. Remember when we saw space, we ignored it. To ignore something, just set start to pause. You just ignore it. I don't care what that is. I don't need it. We're done. OK, backup is kind of the inverse of next, because next, advanced pause, and remembers the width. So to back up one character in the input, because you've gone one too far, you stepped into the number, but you didn't really want to, all you have to do is back up pause. You know, I did, I did this. Oops, nope, that was wrong. Back up. OK. So that's back up. And then there's this lovely thing called peak, um, which is uh, in a lot of this kind of software, which basically says, I don't want to advance, but I need to know what's coming. Sometimes you want to sort of literally peek ahead one in the input without actually reading it. And that's trivial. You just call next and then back up. Right? That's easy. You can do it other ways, but that's, that's an easy way to do it. And now we're ready to uh, write a couple of helpers that are really, really great for scanning complicated stuff. And these are the acceptors. And I, there's two accept functions. One is called accept. It's actually a method on Lexer. And what you do is you give it a string of characters that you think are OK to have now. You ask the question, can I accept one of these into the input? And it might be like a string of digits or a string of alphabetics. These are things that might happen now. And so what you do is you just say, does the string, basically that line there, index rune says, does the, character, the next character of the input, is it an element of that string? And if the answer is yes, you return true. You called next, so you've accepted it. And you report back, yes, I accepted one of those. If it's false, you've actually gone too far. So you back up and say, no, I, I can't accept one of those now. I'm on something else. OK? And then accept run is the same, except it's in a for loop. It just says, accept as many of these as you can. I want a run of digits or a run of alphabetics or whatever. So you give it a string, same as you did for accept. But now it loops absorbing as many as it can. And because of this particular lecture, we don't need a return value. But you could imagine returning whether or not you got anything. OK? And now, now we can do a number. And numbers are actually quite hard to lex, especially if you think of a number in all of their forms. There's decimal. There's octal. There's hexadecimal. There may be other bases. Who knows? There are floating point, floating point with decimal, floating point with, uh, without a decimal, exponents, positives, negatives, positive exponents, negative exponents, a lot of formats. For fun, try to write the right expression that matches a number. You will be surprised. It's about this long. Okay? But now we're going to use the tools we've built to lex one really neatly. And here's how it goes. Now remember, we don't have to keep track of where, what we're actually pulling out of the string, because the, the underlying mechanism of the lexer, just advancing pause through the string, is doing that for us. All we have to find is the, the end of it. So we just start at the top. Accept a plus or minus. Notice it's a, it's not, we don't care what the return value is. If it's a plus or minus, that's fine. We can accept one of those. It doesn't matter if it's not there. We just accept it if we can. Now, we know that we're probably looking for a decimal number, so we set the digits to the, all the decimal digits. But it might be an octal or a hex constant. So ask the question, can we accept a 0 and an x? And if the answer is yes, then we have like 0x something. It's a hex number, so advance the base set to 0 to f. Uh, hexadecimal. Now we're scanning a hex number. Now we accept a run of those digits, whatever base they're in. I notice I didn't do octal, but I'll come back to that. 
Um, now we're at the end of the number. Maybe there's a decimal point. Except if we can accept the decimal point, then there might be more digits. Then if I can accept an exponent, there might be a sign for the exponent, in which case there might be more uh, digits to come for the exponent itself. And so we're sort of sucking up all of this stuff. Now this is Go. Go has complex numbers, and it's got imaginary constants. And this is actually a constant, not a true complex number. So now we have to question, well, maybe, maybe I can accept an i now, because it's an imaginary number. And we're still just sucking all this up as we go. And then we do an error check to make sure that things make sense, because when we get to this point, this is the longest we can possibly go into a number and still be a number. The very next character can't be something that it has to be something like a space or a punctuation. It can't be an alphanumeric or the input's bad. So there's an error check. But you kind of don't need that, but it, it's nice to get it early. Now notice that if you think about this, you can write down constants that aren't actually valid. You might write 0x3e4, which isn't actually a valid constant because you can't have hexadecimal floating point numbers. Um, and that's because it's, it's fine for a lecturer to say, I think what I know what this is, and still expect the parser to validate it. And there's a lot of edge cases around numbers that are very tricky to get right. And so that's why we didn't worry about octal versus decimal and any of that stuff. We said, this is a maximal length thing that might be a number. And now the parser, I'm not going to show you that code, but the parser is going to actually try to convert it to a number. And there's a number parser in the library, and it'll complain if there's a mistake in that as a number. So we just have to find a maximal string and let the parser do the hard work, which is kind of nice. So you see how much these accept functions are helping? And all this magic going on with the covers, it's actually really, it's actually kind of fun to write this the first time you go through it, because you go, oh, that's really easy. It's kind of cool. OK, and then finally, once we're done, we've moved pause up to the end of the number. So we emit item type number. That's almost the first thing I showed you, is the type number idea, item number. So you emit the number, so it's a number, and its value is this string from the input. And now the new state is we're back inside actions again. Because we know we start inside an action, we found a number, we're done with a number, we're back in the inside action state. And so the state machine will grind up, OK? Everybody reasonably comfortable with what's going on here? Two or three of you are shaking your heads. Most of you are nodding. It's good. OK, now notice this error thing. One reason I want to show you this slide is there's return l dot error f. And notice it's a return. This is a state function, so it has to return a state function. Notice that the error is actually a state, state function itself, in a, in a sense. Errors look like this. There's a function called error f. And using uh, Go's nice uh, function call stuff, you actually, ARF is kind of a form of printf. So it looks like printf. There's a format string and some arguments, which are the, dot, if you don't know what the interface open close means, just think of it as like a generic object or a void star. And so this lets you print anything to that format. Um, and what you do is, it's, it's folded funny, but that state fun on the second line there is actually the return type. So error is actually a state function that returns a state function. And so now you send out on the items channel item that consists of error and the nicely formatted error that was created by the tokenizers, which will include the text of the thing that had the bad syntax. I believe in really good error messages. This is a really easy way to make them. And now we return nil. Remember that the state machine stops when the state goes to nil. So this, when we get an error, we stop. We just shut down the machine. We've got an error. We can't go on. And of course, you can imagine doing other things to recover and keep going. But, but still, it's, that's pretty neat. For the application of the template scanner, if there's an error in the input, you really don't want to keep going. You want to stop. So those are errors. They fit in really nicely to the model. OK, so what's the story here? Well, we've built this little lexer. You could argue that it's more complicated than you wanted to write. You could be right. I think it's kind of cool how the state machine works, how Go's slicing of strings managed to make it all fit together really neatly, the idea of the tokens going over the channel. It's really, it was really fun to write. It was really easy to write. Uh, I did it in an evening, probably less than that, the first time around. Um, after throwing away a couple of other lectures that were done other ways that I wasn't happy with. And I, once I accepted it as a concurrent problem to deal with this structural mismatch between the lexer and the parser and the input, it all worked out really neatly. So you get this, these go routines running, the channels. It's all really nice, OK? But there's a problem. The problem is. When you want to create a variable in, in a Go program as a global, like a template for an, H, for an HTML server, and you want to be able to deliver uh, stuff to the user using a parse template ready to run, you want to be able to build that template at initialization time. But you can't do that in Go because 
that would mean running a go routine in an initialization function. And that's actually against the rules. It's, the reason it's against the rules is Go has very clean initialization semantics. And if you have concurrent execution during initialization, the semantics get very, very fuzzy. And so it was a difficult decision, but we decided you just simply cannot run a Go routine to completion during initialization. You can create one, but it won't run. It doesn't run until initialization is done. And now we have a problem because this lexer is concurrent, but it can't run during initialization, which, was which sort of defeats the purpose of having H uh, HTML templates parsed at initialization time. But turns out it's easy to fix. Or I wouldn't be here. Okay. Now we have a design for Alexa that's really clean and really nice, but we have to take the concurrency out again. That sounds awful, right? We've done all this work to set up this beautiful concurrent model, but it turns out it's like trivial code to take it out again, and that's kind of cool. What we do is we change the input. What we a, a sort of traditional Lexing API doesn't involve channels and stuff like that. It's just got a function to get me the next item. So how do we transform our existing code into that? It's actually just a couple of small changes. First of all, we, in the Lex creator, we don't return the channel anymore. We just want the Lexer. The guy just wants a handle for the Lexer. That makes sense, OK? And then in the channel that we create, we still make a channel. We're still going to use one. We're going to hide it. And we're going to buffer it. And the effect of buffering it is that uh, it turns it kind of into a ring buffer in the sense that you can, the Lexer can emit a few things into the channel and then pick them up itself later. It doesn't, it's not synchronously bound. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. The point is we're sort of cheating and turning a channel into a ring buffer by just adding a couple of cells to, of buffering to the channel. So we create it just like we did before. We change the channel slightly, and we return the Lexer, but no channel, back to the caller. So now he's got a handle on the Lexer. Now we write the next item function, which is the thing that most Lexers would expect to have used in order to get the next token out for the parser. But remember, we have this run loop running. But, and yet we can't stop execution. But it turns out it's very easy to do. It doesn't look like the old run loop, but it's exactly the same thing going on. It's just decomposed a little bit. There's a forever loop, and inside this forever loop, so we have a select statement. And select is goes concurrent multi-way switch. It says, does any of these things, can any of these things happen now? And if the answer is not, we wait. If the answer is yes, th then one of them will proceed. So the, the, thing, the way it works here, is we have a select, and if the item can be received from the channel of items, that means we've lexed something that's ready, then we just return it. And it's taken out of the channel and delivered to the, the caller. Okay? If not, then we fall to the default state, which is what happens when nothing can run, and there's only one other case, so it means the other guy can't run. And now there's the inner loop of the inner line of our loop. We just run state one, machine one iteration. That may or may not emit some tokens. If it doesn't emit tokens, we'll go around again. Select will fail. We'll fall through default. We'll run it again. And we'll keep running the state machine going around this loop until eventually we manage to emit a token into the channel. And once that happens, the caller will get it. So it's kind of magic. This is sort of the most magical slide of the ones I'm showing you. But if you don't understand this, that's OK. All I want to show you is that that's all that was required to remove the concurrency from the picture. And yet, and so now we have a totally traditional API for Alexa. Create Alexa and call next item on until you get EOF. That's the whole API. But under the covers, there's this very clean, sort of pretty lexical structure with concurrency going on that we actually use to design a really nice internal design. So we now have this traditional API, and it's really concurrent under the covers, but you can't see it. And if you think about it, if you started trying to write the next item API, you probably wouldn't have built such a nice lexer because you would have had to do that state and recovery thing that you do in the switches, where you're always coming back and figuring out what state you're in and restarting and restarting. The beauty of this thing is the restart is just running the machine a little differently. It's still the same machine. It still feels like state functions. It still has all that clarity. So the design is still really good. And this is a really important point about concurrency. Concurrency is this design concept. It's not about the way a lot of people think about it, sort of parallelism. It's actually a design idea. And we use it here to deal with this structural mismatch from, from Michael Jackson, who, by the way, was not the musician, in case you think it was the same guy. Um, so concurrency is a design approach. It's not about parallelism. Concurrency enables parallelism, doesn't require it. It's really about thinking about your problem as independently executing items that may run at the same time or not, but conceptually, each one is an independently executing item. And it gives you a real sort of grace in design. 
that you don't get with a lot of other approaches. And sometimes concurrency is a real win. It's not a panacea, um, but it's still pretty nice. And notice we were using methods and stuff like that. So we had object-oriented programming along with concurrency. It's kind of, kind of neat how that works. And you get this wonderful sort of adaptable model. This Lexer has been, this is, I, the one I showed you, except for the last slide, um, was the, like the first day's version. I went back in the, in the logs and pulled out a really early one. And it's been adapted quite a bit as the, le as the template language has been worked out. It was sort of designed on the fly. Um, so there's a lot more features to the Lexing, a lot more tokens to be found, things like that. But each time it was like a one or two line change or a two line state function had to be added. It was just, I just loved how easily it, it changed as I needed it, which is something that was sadly missing from the predecessor template system. So in conclusion, lectures are fun. Concurrency is fun. And Go is a lot of fun. So I encourage you to play around with it. If you want to know more about it, of course, golang.org is the website where all this Go stuff lives. Uh, the new template system is actually kind of interesting, I think. Uh, and Andrew will show you a little tiny bit of it later. Um, and it's, it's also on the uh, golang.org site. Um, it will become the standard templates in the next release. So we've, we're, we're deprecating the old ones. So these templates will be available. You didn't see what they can do, but they're kind of cool. Um, and so if, with that, I guess I'll take questions. And please use a microphone for questions so people at home can follow along. What's the build output for this? So is it, is it like a binary? Um, what, what areas can it be used in? Um, for like for example, with .NET, is it just a library that you can include and start making references into it? Is it integrated? Oh, both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so linked binary that you can then run, and the Lexer that I showed you is a piece of. It's actually been broken out now separately, but it's a it's a piece of a library in effect that you link into your program when you want to do lexing, and so it's a statically compiled binary that runs. We have uh, implementations for several architectures and several operating systems, um, but it's it's not a .NET. There is actually a .NET implementation underway. I don't know how far along it is. I think reasonably far, but it's not done yet. But for the most part, Go we think of as a statically compiled language that has uh, you know, the performance characteristics of, a, of such a language, as opposed to an interpreter. Um, have you had any performance stats on that, Lexa? Uh, I was thinking of that just before this talks. I figured, oh, someone's going to ask me on the performance test, and I haven't checked it. The answer is it's probably OK, but not great, because I'm using the language a little too, having a little too much fun with the language, and doing the channel communication and, and that kind of stuff actually puts more overhead into the inner loop than, than needs to be there. With a little more work, I could take that out. But as, as demonstrated here, I think it would, it would be, the performance would be good, but not great. I think you could do significantly better by eliminating some of that. The other stuff about how the state functions work and all that should be essentially as good as it can go to a first approximation. The only way you can do better is to have uh, to build a state machine by hand with switches that are indexed into a table and have function pointers in the table and just grind like that. But it amounts to the same thing. And I think there's a chance this is just as good as, as that would be. If not, it'd be very close. But no, to be honest, I have not measured it, and I probably should. Hi, uh, sorry. Um, with the concurrency where you remove the Go routine, if you had multiple stages, um, could, the, could the Go routine be put back and then say, well, kick it off outside of the initialization? Um, and does, does it Well, the problem is you want the Go routine to run to completion during initialization because you want to lecture input and generate the parse tree for the template. So you can't, you can't put it on hold until later. That just blocks everything. What you can do is uh, depending on, there's this magic step. It is pretty magic, I admit. But I thought it was magic enough to show you. That too is a very magic number it, uh, in the buffering you, because the, we know that the lexer never emits more than two items per invocation. You could make that an arbitrarily bigger number to be fine, but there's no point in making it bigger than it needs to be. But as far as restarting the, the lexer while it's running, uh, it'll sit and wait for you until you come back. So it will do that. Staging them together, doing parsing the same kind of way would work fine too. You could you could gang them up. And, and is it is it in the next token where it's sitting now? Does it actually block? Yes, it will block waiting for the next token to be parsed. If you wanted to, if you unbuffered, the, if you made the channel arbitrarily buffered, it could get arbitrarily far ahead. But why do that? It's just using up memory. It doesn't need to. And it's also remember totally synchronous here. So there's no 
There's no scheduling issues. There's no, this is a single threaded thing. Even in the other, in the other guy I showed you, it's still single threaded. It's concurrent, it's not parallel. So the thread of control is very direct. It never, it never so it has to switch between threads or anything like that. So it doesn't look it, but it's actually linear execution all the time. Do we have any, com any questions from the IRC room I should handle? We don't need to scroll back. The question was, um, could the concurrency component, so instead of using the channel, could you just create like a list or a vector and push all of the token or the items onto that list instead a of? Absolutely. And in fact, after I did this, Nigel sent me a CL to do exactly that. Um, and I kept it, in, I, I, it's probably better and it probably fixed the, what performance problems there may be, if any. Um, but I, it just wasn't as pretty, so I pushed back. <laughs> I, li I like this better. But you know, if this turned out to be criti performance critical, I would definitely switch to a, a, a regular by hand ring buffer. It'd only add about 10 lines of code to the whole thing. It'd be pretty easy. But there's nothing inherent. The point about this is there's nothing inherently concurrent about the problem, only the solution. The solution gets pretty because you can use concurrency to solve the problem. And I just wanted to ask a naive question for me, but in terms of efficiency, how many times do you copy the input text? You copy the input text um, zero times. There's no copying whatsoever. The parser might make a copy. I don't know. It's what the client does. But the Lexer receives an input string, and everything it delivers to the, to the uh, parser is coming directly out of the input. So if you have a megabyte string with no actions in it, it will not make a copy of that megabyte string. You know, you'll just get a, you'll get a slice of it, which is actually really cheap and does not copy the data. So it's efficient in that respect, if that's what you're getting at. Any other questions? How much work would be involved in uh, making it accept a reader rather than uh, a pre-read string? Uh, to do a reader from this would be very easy. Um, a reader is an uh, uh, interface ID in Go that is the generic representation of anything it knows how to read, like a file or a network or a buffer. And uh, it would cl uh, clumsy up a little bit of the code, but I think all you really have to do is modify a little bit of the lexer structure, the actual object, and change the next function to go for the reader. And I think backing up might be a little trickier, but not very much. I've done it in, in other contexts. It would make it it'd be a little more noise, but it would work just fine. And you could actually do it in the abstract by turning the string into a reader and using the reader for everything, and then any input would work. Uh, in, the, in the narrow confines of the template package, that didn't make a lot of sense. In a more general context, uh, like a regular expression scanner or something like that, it might make perfect sense. That, that, that follows on. Uh, has this inspired you to look at other, uh, uh, other areas in, inside Go, like XML, date parsing, things like that, the HTTP parsing? Uh, it hasn't inspired me to do that, although, as I said, there was this blog post last week where somebody was parsing HTML with regular expressions, and I gave him a smackdown. So uh, I hope, to, to his credit, he, he said it was interesting to read my response, and he did change the way he was doing it. Um, but I, I don't think, I, the reason I chose this program to present it is I think it's, a, it's in a lot of ways, it's idiomatic Go. There's a little bit of concurrency, a little bit of object-oriented object stuff. There's some nice use of strings, and you see methods and functions. There's sort of a lot of things going on. And it's a problem that's a very nerdy problem. I mean, not very many people write lectures for a living. Um, but it's kind of nice to see how all the pieces fit together and how the design works. It's not clear that it's the solution to world hunger, but it's a solution to flexing my templates. Anyone else? Hello. Yeah. Do you think this technique could be used um, for a parse generator? Could could a parse generator spit out code that looks like this? Um, it could. Um, parse generators are more complicated because they have more state. Um, but the short answer is yes. I mean, this is, this, is, this is a state machine, right? And a parser is a state machine. So it, yes, you can do it. Uh, I'm not sure it would be a, a win. A, a state functions might be clunkier. But they might not. I, I, I haven't thought about it. It, it, would, it would certainly be doable. Um, if you look at what Raggle does, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, the, it's the Lexer generator. What it generates internally, you, if you squint the right way, it's kind of you know, the isomorphism to this code but much harder to see. But that's okay, it's generated code, you don't care what it looks like. So yeah, you could do that, but that's, that's a different problem. But parsing, you could do this way, yep, absolutely. Not, it'd be a lot of states, parsing has many, many states. Right, there's only about, 
maybe 10 or 15 state functions in this lexer. There'd probably be several hundred in a typical parser. So there'd be a lot of boilerplate. You'd probably want a machine to help you write it. Yep? No, don't. No. Use, use, the, use the mic. Um, how would you tackle progress updates, and is there any way to receive event notification while the lexical parser is operating? Um, I don't know, understand the first question. So, if, if, okay, so if you've got a very long process that's going through, uh -huh. is there any way that you could receive updates about how far it's, it's been processing through it? Or sure. Just pass, pass See this select the statement here? Yeah. The select statement allows multi-way concurrent communication. So you could easily put inside here with probably like four lines a way to signal the lecture says, I want to know where you are, and it could respond. So whenever you care about the result, you could ping it and say, tell me how far you are, and it could respond. That could be done in the same loop. Or you could just have it periodically emit an update notice. I've, I've done a K, I've done 10K, whatever it is. And it could be easily put inside the, the select block or on a counter inside here. Can you have any way of, um, uh, under certain conditions, writing things to a file, for example? Sure. Yeah, you, yeah I mean, it's a programming so language. You can write to files anytime you want. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very, yes, absolutely. Okay. Files are cool. Underrated. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I have a horrible scheduling conflict, and I'm supposed to be somewhere else half an hour ago, which is when my talk started. Um, so I have to run, and I'm really sorry about that. This was a very unfortunate scheduling 